to the first uh, uh, European book club from uh, uh, the Italian Cultural Institute. My name is Renata Sperandi. I'm the director of the Institute. Delighted to welcome Sandro Veronese and his English voice, uh, Michael Moore. Uh, American both voice. With us tonight. <laughs> American, Irish American voice. Uh, Irish American <laughs> voice, in fact. And uh, yeah, as I said, this is the first of a series of at least five events. The next will be um, by, with a French author, Anne Gareta, on the 4th of March. Then on the 8th of April, the German author, Dörte Hansen. On the 6th of May, Spanish author, Andres Barba and on the 3rd of June, the Irish author and Anne Wright. This is in fact a collaboration, as I said, of the UNIC Ireland and uh, so far, and this, uh, you know, idea, uh, the institutes joining in are the Alliance, the Goethe Institute, the, uh, Cervantes, the Cervantes and Literature Island. So um, yes, here we are. Uh, thank you all for, for being with us, uh, all the people that have joined us tonight and have included one more Zoom event to their daily schedule. Um, it is, as I said, the first European book club. We don't know exactly how this is going to um, take shape, but uh, the idea is to record this event anyway to open up a chat uh, for questions from the public and uh, to make sure that everybody has an enjoyable time and make it as informal as possible. So I'd like to thank the, all the members of the UNIC Club here at Ireland for having started this, uh, this new adventure together. So Sandro Veronese is a very well-known and successful Italian author. Um, he is, together with only one other Italian, Volponi, twice the winner of the most prestigious Italian book prize, the Strega Prize. And uh, the first time he won that prize was with Caos Calmo, this book, translated into, uh, into English and many other languages but that was 15 years ago, over 15 years ago. Uh, more recently, the other book that gave him, again, the uh, Strega Prize is the Hummingbird in Italian, Il Colibri, which will come out in English in a couple of months. So here we are with Michael Moore, who's translated many, many Italian authors uh, uh, from, uh, Primo Levi, to Eri De Luca, to so many, uh, among them also Manzoni, and uh, his Promessi Sposi will be published in English later this year, hopefully after a long, long time of studies and preparation. So uh, welcome. Uh, I'll leave it to uh, Sandro to uh, say something if he feels like it. I thought that the event could start with a one minute reading from Chaos Calmo in Italian, followed by a one minute reading in English from the same book. And perhaps Sandro could start, if that is fine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, for, for choosing me for, the, for starting with this. Uh, series of events. I hope uh, everything will will be all right and the meeting will not be boring. I will read one page of uh, the first, the very first page of this. For me, really past novel, fifteen over fifteen years ago. Là, dico, abbiamo appena fatto surf, io e Carlo, surf, come vent'anni fa. Ci siamo fatti prestare le tavole da due pischelli e ci siamo buttati tra le onde alte, lunghe, così insolite nel tirreno che ha bagnato tutta la nostra vita. Carlo più aggressivo e spericolato, ululante, tatuato, obsoleto, col capello lungo 
al vento e l'orecchino che sbilluccicava al sole, io più prudente e stilista, più diligente e controllato, più mimetizzato, come sempre. La sua famigerata classe Beat e il mio vecchio understatement su due tavole che filavano al sole e i nostri due mondi che tornavano a duellare come ai tempi dei formidabili scazzi giovanili, ribellione contro sovversione, quando volavano le sedie, mica scritto. Non che si sia dato spettacolo, visto che è già tanto se siamo riusciti a non cadere dalle tavole, o meglio, abbiamo dato lo spettacolo di chi è stato giovane anche lui e per un breve periodo ha creduto che certe forze potessero veramente prevalere e in quel periodo ha imparato a fare un sacco di cose che in seguito si sono rivelate sovranamente inutili, tipo suonare le congas o rotolare una moneta tra le dita come David Hemmings in Blow Up o rallentare il battito cardiaco per simulare un attacco di bradicardia e venire riformati al servizio militare, o ballare lo ska, o rollare le canne con una mano sola, o tirare con l'arco, o la meditazione trascendentale, o, per l'appunto, il sesso. I due pischelli non potevano capire. Lara e Claudia erano già tornate a casa. Nina 2004 è partita stamattina presto. Carlo cambia fidanzata ogni anno. E così io e Lara abbiamo cominciato a millesimarlo. Non c'era nessuno a goderselo. È stato uno spettacolo tra noi due. Uno di quei giochi che hanno senso solo tra fratelli, perché un fratello è testimone di un'inviolabilità che da un certo momento in poi nessun altro è più disposto a riconoscerti. Michael? Anche, anche per me è, è la prima volta che guardo queste pagine da non so quanti anni e Vengono bene, eh, mi faccio i complimenti. Over there, I say, we've just finished surfing, Carlo and I. Surfing, like we did 20 years ago. We borrowed the boards from a couple of kids and dove into the high long waves, so unusual in the Tyrrhenian Sea, that has bathed us our whole lives. Carlo, more aggressive and daring, howling, tattooed, over the hill with long wind-blown hair and an earring that glitters in the sun. Me, more prudent and stilista, more diligent and controlled, better camouflaged, as always. His beat generation shabby chic and my traditional understatement on two surfboards racing in the sun and our two worlds dueling again like in the formidable quarrels of our youth, rebellion versus subversion, when the shit hit the fan, no joke. Not that we put on much of a show since it was all we could do to keep from falling off the boards. It's more like we were making a spectacle of ourselves, two no longer young guys who for a short period had actually believed certain forces would prevail. And during that period, learned to do all sorts of things that later turned out to be supremely useless, like playing the congas or rolling a coin between our fingers like David Hemmings in Blow Up, or slowing down our heartbeats to simulate Brady, Brady Cardia and thus be exempted from military service or dancing the ska or rolling a joint with one hand or shooting with a bow and arrow or doing trans transcendental meditation or in this case surfing. The two surfer kids would never understand. Lara and Claudia had already gone home. Nina 2004 left early this morning. Carlo changes girlfriends every year so Lara and I have taken to counting them by the thousands. We had no audience. It was just a little show that he and I put on for each other. One of those games that makes sense only between brothers. Because a brother is witness to an invulnerability that no one else sees in you after a certain point. So here we are at the beginning of the novel and we have all the elements there or most of them, but surprise, surprise, there's a scene will change completely in two pages and the story will develop from there. And uh, however, by the end of the novel, everything will somehow make sense. Uh, I was wondering if uh, Sandro would like to tell us about what he feels about this novel after 15 years and perhaps then ask Michael to produce the first question of a dialogue, which I hope our public will continue with more questions through the chat. So, Sandro, can I throw the ball to you? Well, as I told you, uh, it's strange for me to focus uh, on quiet chaos after over 15 years, also because it's, uh, 
Uh, I have been following the hummingbird since one year and a half, and uh, um, I have been forced to focus on it so that all the other books, previous books, including uh, Quiet Chaos, uh, were almost erased by my memory, by my exercised memory. This is um, quite, for me, quite amusing because uh, um, by reading this first page, actually, I didn't read again Quiet Chaos. I just read it thousand of times while writing it and never read it as a book. So this is one of the first times in all these 15 years uh, I, I, I really read a page. Uh, sure, it's the first time after a lot of years that I read it loud voice, loud voice. So it's amusing because while reading, I discovered again all these mental places where at the time, and we are talking about uh, 20 years ago, when I started writing the, the novel, all the, those places uh, that were my landmarks uh, in, 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 in what at the time was a simple idea of a novel. And one of these places was exactly that kind of relationship between the two, the two brothers. Of course, the main character is one, is the voice, Pietro, and not his brother. His brother is, is one of the other characters. Uh, but one of the most important um, themes uh, in the whole novel is the relationship between the two brothers, because, um, because it's really something that creates the characters of, of the two. Two brothers very close uh, in age, very different and uh, differently positioned in the world, uh, which uh, who had battled and argued a lot of time once kids or boys or, ch or children and starting from a certain moment uh, they stopped arguing, uh, but they find themselves involved again in this, uh, in this battle, because being brothers is battling with love, of course, but battling the whole day, the whole life. And I remember this was one of the, of the inspiring energetic points. I knew from the very beginning, when I had just the, the simple naked idea of uh, not of a novel, but of a po potential story, I knew that if I needed energy during my effort, this was one of the places where I could have found energy, the relationship between the main character and his brother. Actually, the real primary scene, the uh, originary scene, who, which created the intention of writing a novel, uh, was, uh, was fun because um, it was a, um, something that was told me by a friend. Once I was, I was elected as a consultant of uh, the French company of Canal Plus, who bought the Italian pay TV to create a new uh, pay TV in Italy. They called me, I don't know why, as a consultant, just to, uh, to take care of Italian uh, habits and culture not to reproduce exactly the format of a French TV. And I was there uh, helping them to 
understand Italy. But all the people who were working in the Italian pay TV, they thought that French, the French would have, or would have changed everything and fired a lot of people. So even if they didn't know me, all of them wanted to talk with me and asked me to protect them, to protect their job. Of course, uh, the French, they didn't have any intention to fire anybody. But my, my presence in the very first time uh, was taken as a protection of Italian, Italian workers in the uh, not Italian anymore uh, pay TV. One of these friends who came to, to tell me that he would have um, he would have lost a, a, an important job and uh, for him it was important to stay there and everything, just everybody else did, uh, told me about the only guy who didn't come, a guy who, whom I knew, one of the few that I knew in advance, that actually didn't even called me. And I asked this other friend why this guy didn't call me, didn't find me. And he told me, oh, uh, he lost his wife uh, one month ago. And now he's focused on his daughter. It is as if, it is as if, he told me, it is as if he stays the whole day in front of the school of his daughter. It was a metaphor. It was, a, it was a, as if, just to mean how focused he was on his familiar situation after the tragedy. And this happened years before. But at, at a certain point, I thought, and if I, if I put off the as if, if there is a guy who stays really the whole day in front of the school of his daughter, what happened? There is something to, to tell. It is a story. I don't, I still don't know, but there is a, 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 a real literary difference between staying in front of a school the whole day or behaving as if you stay the whole day in front of the school. This was the first image. And uh, as you understand, there was energy, but there is no story. So I had to find different other points of energy to create a story in um, regarding this guy who stays the whole day in front of the school of his daughter. Uh, and the brother who was supposed to go there to check what was going on, why his brother is staying the whole day in front of the school of his daughter. Of course, the reason was the same. He had lost his wife, but it's not so uh, normal as a behavior. And this was the very beginning of the story. But first of all, I decided to point out what kind of relationship there was between the two brothers. And I, I was inspired that time. Uh, I was reading a lot of American literature and I was, I was uh, studying the difference between rebellion and subversion uh, by reading Jack Kerouac and Jerome David Salinger, for example, the rebel and the subversive. 
So I decided to put this battle. This was the battle from, between the two brothers. There, were, there was the, the same aim because sometimes you have two brothers who have really different aims. Uh, one is more conservative, the other is more liberal, and this is the conflict. But in this case, they had the same aim, but two totally different behaviors, subversion versus rebellion. And I thought that this could be really important because what I had decided that the main character would have done, stopping himself, stopping his life in front of the school of his daughter, uh, was really difficult to, uh, to classify. Is it rebellion or is it subversion? It is subversive or it is a rebel, the guy who quit his work. It doesn't work anymore. It just stays the whole day in front of the school of his daughter. And this could mean that there was, there was the danger for his brother that he was stealing his own identity uh, with a behavior that probably right. would so have been put extremely in, interesting in, i think and i, I was uh sandra i can't i don't know yeah, if there no, is no. a problem in my connection can I, no okay i i couldn't hear you anymore and i the computer is telling me that my connection is unstable which is i very, had finished <laughs> right <laughs> the whole the whole story was that subversion <laughs> against rebellion and the fact uh, that it was unclear if staying in front of a school the whole day was to consider an act of subversion right. and or now an act it's stopped of again rebellion. for me, but maybe not for everyone. And I just wanted to point out that besides Michael's, we have already a couple of questions from the public in case you wanted to uh, Kate, to take uh, those questions, but I, I'm being reassured that reception for most of the public is fine. It's just my problem. Okay. So sorry about the. <laughs> Shall I go? So, if 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 it is okay for Sandro. Yeah, I mean, because there's be there's so many things that you're saying that resonate with me. I mean, when you talk about the brother, I mean, I have three brothers, <laughs> you know, with good Irish names, you know, the Thomas Joseph and Sean. Michael Francis, you know, and uh, Thomas, Joseph, and Francis. But, um, and, and it also, it's funny because um, one of the stories that I translated for Sandro was a uh, prophecy yeah. where he talked, where you talk, Sandro, about the, the death of your parents. And then later on, and, and it was a difficult story. It was all written in the uh, future conditional, if I remember correctly. And then I was interpreting for your brother who was presenting a film of a very different genre, but in presenting the film, he told the same story. And I think he even told it after I'd asked him not to tell the story because it was just so heartbreaking, you know, for me. And, um, and I'm saying this because I think a lot of the question of voice, you know, as, as a translator, the way that I started translating for Sandro was very fortuitous and it involved Renata. Um, there was, uh, Sandro was coming to New York for an event, a European writers uh, of some sort, I think. And as usual, there's something that had to be translated very quickly. So I like dashed off in maybe 15 minutes, a few pages. And Sandra was very happy, but it wasn't just about making him happy. It was also about an approach to translation um, that I had, and I wish I could return to almost this idea of a translation being done on a single breath, that it should look easy, that it should be like filled with sprezzatura in a way, you know, that it should just come out very naturally, no tension with the Italian, and what I look for in a book is energy. You know, uh, when you translate, you, you do have what the Italians call a deformazione professionale, the sort of, um, I don't even know how to say it in English, but basically you have your, um, your prejudices, I guess, your way of reading and the way you read as a translator is you look for the energy of the prose. You know, you're not necessarily looking for characters that you like or a plot. You're just seeing if the language carries you along. 
And I have to say this language has carried me along. And even though it's a long book, more than 400 pages, I do have the feeling, I hope you as readers have it as well, of it being written on a single breath almost, you know. Um, and on that note, um, uh, again, it was very refreshing to sort of return to that because what I'm working on now is this 19th century novel, which is not written on a certain breath. And I'm rewriting it constantly and checking the dictionary and it's very tormented. And I'm trying to make it look easy, which isn't easy. Um, never show your hands, but it's a tour, that great expression. But I'm wondering, uh, Sandro, whether your approach to writing has changed since then, that in, in looking back at these pages and looking the way that you write now, whether there has been an evolution in the way that you write, because there is a freedom to your writing in Cow's Kalma, which might be an illusion. I don't know how tormented you were in the writing of it. Um, and I don't necessarily see that in your later works, that same um, flow, you know. Well, what I feel that is not necessarily the truth, but it's what I feel is that now I, I am, I have freed my writing much more than 15 years ago. With the hummingbird, I experienced uh, this sense, uh, the, 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 the final sense uh, of freedom as a writer, because I decided not to um, take in any account the concept of time. You know, time is a crucial, a crucial item. You have to deal with it. You have to do something with, with time. And time, when, I, when, when you write a novel, it means almost uh, three different times. There is the time, you, four, probably. There's the time of the story. You are, you, I read something that was talking about probably half an hour, one hour surfing. The time that was inside that page was the one hour action. Then there is the time I spent for writing this page that normally is two or three days. And then there is the time the reader spent for reading it, that normally is two minutes. And you have to deal with all these different times. Because even if it's not possible to know it in advance, how to do it in advance, you have, you have to find an harmony. Uh, it's just like cooking. You know, you can follow this, the receipt uh, but there is not only the quantity. There is the, the there is the intensity of the fire that is not written on the receipt. So you cannot be sure until the, the moment you taste it that you got it. And this is the same. But writing a novel with all these uh, duties. Uh, in, 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 in relationship with all these different kind of time you have to deal with uh, limit, limit, it limits a lot your freedom. Uh, and in, in, at that time when I wrote Quiet Chaos, I didn't dare, I didn't dare to go against uh, the rule that is try to harmonize time with time with time and get the final result as, a, as something that is bringing his own time. I didn't, I didn't uh, dare to deny uh, the power of this di dictatorship. 15 years after, when I started writing The Hummingbird, I decided that I would have tried. I would have tried to 
to fight the the dictator, to find the freedom, riding over uh, over over time, over the time of the of the story of the little singular scenes and enjoying my time as a writer writing just what I wanted to write in that exact moment and this is some something revolutionary for me uh, and in that case I ex experienced freedom because you know I thought I was free of choosing whatever I want, I wanted before, but it was nothing in comparison of what I got by denying the priority of the question that is brought by the concept itself of time inside the novel. Um, of course, I was enjoying this during the day and I was really suffering overnight. Um, I hardly, I hardly slept at night because I was thinking that I was crazy. That uh, at the end of this effort, I would have found a failure because, because what I was denying was the structure the structure of, of, of everything is time, if you want. Well. Uh, so I lived in, uh, for three years and a half by riding the hummingbird in a condition, in a very extreme condition, because during the day I was enjoying a sense of freedom that never, never felt before. During the night, I was upset by the idea of a failure because I, I had decided something that was too much for me and for my possibilities. But this was possible because, and this is something that I discovered after, after having finished The Hummingbird, because the material I was dealing in the story was the same, but um, it, it was like going in those corners uh, or opening those doors that in Quiet Cows and other different novels before, I didn't dare to touch and to open. I thought it was enough as an amount of sorrow and of pain to deal with, uh, as, as memories to involve. Uh, it was enough stopping before certain doors. Now, probably because I was moved by this sense of rebellion or subversion against the dictatorship of time, I finally emptied out, really emptied out my dark places where I left, I left something. I didn't explore everything about death, about love, about, about losing, uh, people and losing in life uh, in the previous novels. So if I am able to explain in English, uh, explaining it in English, I was extreme by this time, by facing uh, the real opportunity of being free. And being free, it has a cost. Uh, of course, because we live in a democratic country where we are free by constitution, uh, if we are talking about what 
to write what to say, but it, it's just a, a limited amount of freedom. The necessary, primary, and very important freedom, but it's not the whole freedom you could experience. The whole freedom is, is going outside the structure. And of course, I knew this as a reader. As a reader, I knew it because I read a lot of wonderful masterpieces in which the authors made exactly this. Faulkner, Beckett, Mario Vargas Llosa. I can, they really overwhelmed the concept of time and, right. and went in this mysterious and totally free land that was created by, by their language. I knew that it was possible because I had enjoyed and discovered it in other people's books. The point was, was I able to do that? After 15 years, I decided, yes, I will try. And I slept uh, three hours by each, each night for years because I was preoccupied of being too, uh, that it was too much for me, for my possibilities. And yeah, this is the I think thing you, that I can uh, answer to Michael's <laughs> question. Freedom and the coast of freedom uh, that I experienced now 60 years old and not at that time 45. You know, Sandra, while you were talking, uh, a few questions have accumulated. One is uh, by Oya, um, a colleague uh, of the Goethe Institute. I was wondering if Go she wants to ask her questions herself and unmute herself, or shall I? Yeah, I, I can do that if you like. Um, hey, sure. <laughs> Lovely to <laughs> Hello. see you. Hoy. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. This is uh, such an interesting topic and, and the way you uh, describe the, the approach is fascinating. Uh, I was just wondering whether um, the idea of water, uh, which we, we get in this scene, uh, is part of the energy that you were talking about um, and whether this is also something which creates uh, part of the chaos yes of course this is something that i can that i can't say now after 15 years i i was not at the time um uh, i was not conscient of a lot of things and of processes that were uh, responsible of of, of of this novel but now i can say yes and I can say yes because I have to, to admit that water has um, an extraordinary importance. And also in the hummingbird, in, in the very first pages of Quiet Chaos, we will be facing a typical Eros and Thanatos situation but it was inside the water it was not it's not forcefully in water that you have you, you can experience errors and Thanatos situation whatever but for me it was in in the sea water and uh, one of the original scenes of the hummingbird is uh, is a death by water. That is really important because it is the probably the most powerful um, point of energy of the whole novel. Uh, now I can say yes, this is uh, your observation, your comment is uh, a typical smart 
uh, observation of the reader. As a writer, I can I can say yes, and I can see what I what you 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 are saying after fifteen years, because fifteen years ago, I would have I would have answered that water was the, the consequence of the experience I wanted to to tell, the autobiographical experience I wanted to tell, because the scene of the two women that are almost dead uh, and the two brothers who, are, uh, who save them, that follows the, first, the very first page we read, that scene, it's true. It, it, it happened to me and my brother to have the occasion of, of saving two lives in a very peaceful, uh, apparently peaceful uh, summer day. I wanted, to, I wanted to put in relationship this crazy experience because at the end of this experience, in, 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 our, in our real experience, uh, nobody, nobody told us thank you. Because nobody, nobody noticed our face. We were just two bodies who helped two other bodies not to die. And once we went outside of the water, uh, we were not recognized by anybody. So nobody told us thanks. And this was a, a real experience, a very, very intense experience. Because during that probably 15, 20 minutes, uh, we risked to die. Um, so it was a really intense, a really intense experience. And I wanted to tell this because for me, it was a good beginning, a good start for a novel if that famous wife who has to die to create the man standing in front of the school of his daughter, if that famous wife dies at home while his husband is saving an unknown woman who will not even recognize him. I just thought that this could create another point of energy. But the point for me was not water. It was my experience. Now I can tell you that after 15 years, after 15 years of analysis too, The point was water. The point is water, for what you say, but also for a, another long series of, of, of things I will, I'm talking about with my analyst. <laughs> right. Well, you know, Sandro, there is one question from a fellow writer, in fact, uh, Catherine Dunn. Perhaps you want to unmute yourself and go ahead with... Uh, with your question, if you sure. <laughs> Thank you, Renata. Thank you. And good evening to Sandro and to Michael. Um, I have to start by saying that that was just a magnificent translation. Um, it was something which certainly felt to me that it was written all in one breath. Um, I, I was in awe as I read it. I mean, I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. And I found the novel completely and utterly captivating. I couldn't put it down, which is re really extraordinary because I actually disliked the main character intensely at times. Um, it was a really interesting window into somebody's head. And I think one of the first things that struck me was the, it, that it raised some really interesting questions about grieving because publicly or socially we expect people to behave in a particular way. 
uh, which then we can say, oh, that's okay. So you're grieving now, so that's fine. Everything is as it should be. And it reminded me of Camus in, in The Outsider, where yeah. the man is essentially condemned because he doesn't cry at his mother's funeral. Um, so the, on, on that one hand, I had immense sympathy from him because I could understand the shock um, of his bereavement. But then, and I'm sorry, but this question has two parts. On the other part, the part where I really disliked him uh, and was actually quite shocked by what he had done um, is the scene between himself and Eleonora. And it's not the graphic nature of the description of the sex they had that, that shocked me, but the fact that this seemed to be a very coldly transactional encounter that she knew that she owed him something because he had saved her life and he knew that and at that moment I felt that was really an abuse of power or an abuse of privilege which made me really dislike him intensely and I just wanted to ask you as the author what motivation you had for the character at that stage I'm very happy if I've misjudged him completely but it didn't feel to me like that so thank you well, um, I was obliged to write the sequel of Quiet Chaos because uh, the novel was really successful and was translated by the Rolls Royce of translator in English and, uh, and so enjoyed uh, the energy and the talent of, of, of the best translator in Europe. Uh, but I, I had put in the story, I, my impression was that I, I had put a lot of things, um, a lot of negative things in, in my main character. And th that scene, it was, just for the reason you, you, you are saying, it's one of these. It was not a saint. It was not an exemplary man. Uh, and there were voices telling this. There, there were scenes, explicit scenes, uh, which showed it. But the, 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 the huge success the novel had over the world didn't include the notion of the fact that Pietro Paladini was not an exemplar man. So I had to write another novel to, to show that he was not, he was not an exemplar man while waiting his daughter in front of his daughter's school. And the first, very first part of, 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 of your question is included too in this not being exemplar because of course, there is the ritual, the mourning, what society expects you do and you don't do after having suffered such a loss. And of course, this is something that has to be respected by one hand, but also discussed by the other if you want to talk about being free. But in that case, he was a father. In both parts of your question, there is the ghost of his daughter. In the second part, in the pornographic scene, the scene is pornographic. And I never wrote something similar before and after that chapter. The scene is so explicit because there is a 10 years old daughter sleeping, probably sleeping, there who can wake up and go and in four steps, four steps, she would have seen what was going on. So I had to be explicit because what this father would have shown to his daughter if only if only she and it, it it could happen because he had lost her mother 
So he was, she was supposed not to sleep very well. She could wake up and go out of, of her room. And what, what would she see? What would have seen that? So I had to be explicit. And in the first part of her, of her question, of course, yes, there is a social ritual and everything, but one, once a parent, once a father, you are responsible not only of your personal um, way of handling sorrow, pain, loss, but also of your daughter's and son's way, because they cannot create anything. They just have to imitate yours. So this responsibility would have suggest to me, for example, I'm father of five, not to stay the whole day in front of the school of, the school of anybody. Because this could be a very bad example to do. And uh, just like in the pornographic scene, it could have been a danger, exposing your daughter to a danger, not protecting her. All these things are in the novel. And uh, for me, Pietro Paladini was a controversial character. Of course, you are in his mind, so you have the, a quantity of wishful thinkings and he's also a good man. Why not? But you cannot deny that uh, the sister of his wife, she tells him clearly who he is. And, and the majority of readers, of the huge amount of readers that this book had, they didn't trust her. But she was telling the truth. So I wrote another novel. Any other question? I think there are, in fact. There is at least one question from William Wall. And I was wondering if William wants to ask the question himself. Uh, sure, I will. Yeah. Um, uh, grazie, Sandro. Veramente uh, un intervento affascinante. My question to you is: uh, Is this? Uh, you've written one collection of poetry right at the beginning of your career. Uh, do you think uh, you said everything that you could say in that form, or that the things you, you need to say now cannot be said that way? And following on from that. Do you think there are regions of experience which can only be described in one form or another? Uh, you're right. I'm discovering that there are places that can be visited just in one way, just with one, in one way. And poetry is one of these possible ways. I started by writing poems, just like the majority of 21, 22 years old boys who, who are thinking or, 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 or probably dreaming of, 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 of being authors. But actually, um, I abandoned poetry not as a reader, and even not as a writer. But I didn't publish, because I understood that my, uh, my true love is the novel. Uh, and so, it, since I had the privilege of, of living my dream of a teenage boy, because I became a writer. I had to focus 
on what was really the object of the dream. And I never dreamt to be a poet. Even if I wrote, and if I, even if I write poems, because as he told you, there are places where you can go just through the poetry. And you can, just like, just like in, on, on, on earth, you can go only climbing with your hands in, in some places. You cannot use any bicycle or, or, or other. You just have to go with your own hands, you know? But there is another reason I have to mention, because as you probably know or not, my studies, my official studies, were architecture. I'm, I'm an architect. And of course, uh, this has formed me as a writer too, not only as an architect, but I cannot even imagine how could I write a novel without having studied architecture. And, uh, and by studying ar architecture, I discovered the real great difference between poetry and narrative. It's a problem, it's, I hope I can show you through this example. This is a sheet of paper. And of course, if I put this pen here, this sheet of paper has no resistance to bear, to stand the weight of a simple pen. But if I, the same sheet of paper, if I give it this form, it stands. Mm -hmm. This is poetry, resistance by form. Narrative is resistance by mass. So you put this, and this can stand the quantity of sorrow, pain, because this is 40 pages. It's uh, just like a block of concrete. It can stand, it can, it can oppose a force to forces. And this is poetry, the form. And uh, there are, there are, I, 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 I thought this studying the hyperbole paraboloid, that is in architecture and engineering is just the, uh, the glorious example of resistance by form because very thin surfaces can stand uh, terrible weights because of the, of the two curves form, hyperbole and parable. And I thought, since, as I told you, I, I was forming myself as an architect, but in my mind, I was forming myself also as a writer. That in that difference, even if, even if I admire poetry much more than narrative, I was bound to create this mass and not the form, the mass, just like Thomas Mann, you know, just like Alessandro Manzoni, dear Michael. Uh, and for these, I write verses, but uh, I don't think that my best is there. It's just a holiday I take, a journey that is important for me uh, because I'm not only a professional writer, I'm also an amateur. And, uh, and I want to, to survive as an amateur as well as I, go, uh, uh, as I grow up as a, as a professional writer. Thank you, may I, may I just say that's a beautiful definition. Poetry as resistance by form and the novel as resistance by mass. I hope you don't mind, but I'll quote you in the future. <laughs> you can use it. 
<laughs> right. We're all stealing from one another. And uh, I have one more question. I think it will be asked both to Michael and uh, to Sandro. And I think we can perhaps close with this, uh, uh, with this last episode of this encounter. Enrica asks uh, about uh, the... Um, the, um, she asks, uh, uh, Sandro, you were awarded the prestigious Estrega Prize for Caos Calmo and for Colibri. So many years later, Colibri, is there a shared moment in these two novels except uh, from their author, which may justify both, both the critical acclaim and the commercial success of the two novels? Is there a secret ingredient? And uh, uh, yes, Michael might uh, you know, answer the same question as well. Well, if I, if I had uh, the know-how <laughs> for writing Quiet Chaos and repeating its success, I wouldn't have waited for 15 years. I would have done it immediately after. Uh, yeah. As I told you, the relationship is that the hummingbird, in terms of handling pain, of handling... Uh, 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 uh. unsayable things, un untouchable, to touch untouchable things. In terms of this, The Hummingbird is the sequel of Quiet Chaos. The story is totally different, but I, I have handled what I avoided to handle handle in quiet chaos because I thought it was enough it was enough what I was handling but you know you have the notion that there is something more there's there is something else that you are ignoring because because it's uh it's shocking for you going this deep it's it's sufficient to stop a little higher and this is the relation the relationship between the hummingbird and all the other novels I wrote before, not only Quiet Chaos. So this doesn't explain the success because uh, it is the same even with other novels, previous or after Quiet Chaos, which didn't have this great success. I simply don't know <laughs> but i want right. to i want to um, to believe that of course i have been a little more a, a little luckier than what i deserve but uh, if the alternative was to be a little unluckier uh, so i want to believe that this is something that i I have chosen by by insisting with novels one in, in, in a society in a literary society uh, where novels are not trusted like I trust I trust novels it's not considered novel a, f a form which can give so much to literature anymore just like sort of dead form. I don't believe this at all. I think that novel is, as I told you, resistance by mass, and it has the possibility of giving any possible freedom to writers and readers. And since I have believed it, and I believe it in it, just like in a religion, against the majority, I want to believe that even if I don't deserve this honor, this double honor, the two books deserve it because they have been written as traditional novels without any hesitation or any... Mm, the instance taken because of some ideological reason. My ideology is the novel, 
Novo is my religion. So uh, the only thing that I can see in both Cascalmo and Colibri is my faith in what I was. Not in my talent, but in what the place where I was putting my efforts. Novo, just like Jean Paul Sartre says, is the place where who he loses, he wins. Right. And I, I well, would answer that. A, um, a wonderful conclusion. But I call yes, <laughs> I would answer that just uh, certainly with an awareness of an Irish audience, which is kind of automatically skeptical of praise. And, and I don't want to flatter Sandro too much. I don't want it to go to his head, you know. Um, I've read for the Premio Strega um, for a few years now as a foreign juror. And I see um, so many Italian uh, novelists sort of struggling. Um, I mean, they don't struggle. Maybe I struggle as a reader saying, why should I read this book? Um, why is this book even being written? And I mean, you have this very heavy tradition in, in Italy, the heaviest tradition of all being the Italian language. Um, that's something that concerns me very much in my scholarly work. I wrote about the history of the Italian language in working on, uh, after doing A Quiet Chaos, I translated some classical authors, now Manzoni, who basically invents modern Italian. And I find myself, uh, as I translated, asking myself, what is good English? This is good Italian. What is good English? Uh, what compels me to read something? And uh, Sandro has been one of the great innovators in the Italian language. And when I read his novels, I'm not questioning the need for this novel at all which I have to say with many, many other novelists, I have to say that they're very derivative um, or they're, um, they're following a genre too much. His novels feel, I don't like the word necessary, uh, but they are. And I think that he answers very honestly to the questions of his time, sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully, which I think might explain the differing success of your novels. I mean, it's always you, but there's the moment there is a relationship to the Italian public, the Italian reading public. But I think that you ask questions that really hit things on the head and you have done great things with the Italian language in terms of bringing it into, let's face it, now into the 21st century, a, a language that has sort of struggled to find a new direction for itself, you know, um, in imitating uh, American models. I, one, many of you probably don't know that uh, Sandro also helped to get the uh, first translation in the world, really, of that huge uh, volume of David Foster Wallace, um, yeah. uh, Infinite Jest, proving yeah. that it could be, he did not translate it, he commissioned it. But he has really absorbed uh, a lot of uh, the lessons of American novelists and used it in a way to, to renew the Italian language. And that would be my answer to the that would, that's why I would have given the prize to both novels. And this is said by the Rolls Royce of translators. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. We've told our public that the event would last an hour, so we need to keep our promise. But I hope the conversation with Sandro Veronese continues by reading his books hopefully uh, also in Italian. I hope it will, there will be a chance for everybody to learn the language and read them in the original language, but they also appear in many European languages. English perhaps is not the one most, uh, um, you know, ready to uh, welcome foreign uh, for, uh, books written in other languages, but we hope it will, that will develop and become more of a habit. It is good to, you know, learn about one another. And this was the purpose of this, uh, um, this idea we had with our friends of the UNIC Center in Ireland. So the appointment is for next, uh, uh, the next appointment is on March the 4th uh, with the French author Anna Gareta, and you will find uh, all the information on all the websites of the institutes involved. Thank you so much, Sandro Veronese. I hope you come to Dublin in person because yeah. I know you're a lover of Irish literature. I would have loved to ask you questions about Beckett in your books. 
Kinney and Joyce, but we'll leave it to next time. So uh, let's meet again. Thank you, everyone. Please stay with the activities of all our institutes and uh, a presto. Grazie. Grazie. Thank you, Renata. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Grazie a tutti. Ciao. Bye bye. See you in Dublin. <laughs> okay. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs>